Can people hear me in the back? Yeah? Okay. Louder. Louder, okay. There's someone talking in the back row. I can hear if you please stop doing that. I'm joking. I can't hear you in the back. <laughs> My name's Steve Souders, and um, I was the head performance engineer at Google, the chief performance Yahoo, the chief performance officer at Fastly. Now I work at a company with, uh, called Speed Curve. Um, with my partner, you'll see his picture in a minute, uh, who lives in New Zealand. It's just the two of us. And about two months ago, I cleared out my garage. So I'm literally working on a startup in my garage. So it's very cool. And it's close by. So um, it's easy for me to get up here for HTML5 DevConf. And I'm glad to be here. And thanks to everyone for turning out. One of the other things that um, I've had the opportunity to do is be co-chair of the Velocity Conference. How many people here have heard of Velocity, been to Velocity? Not very many. We just had it last week in New York City, and we're having it in about two weeks in Amsterdam. We also do uh, Beijing and Santa Clara in June the next year. And one of the things that came out of Velocity, the intention at the beginning, nine years ago when we started the conference, was to bring the world of performance and operations closer together. And out of that, we coined the term DevOps, which is a very popular term these days, a big meme. And you'll see all the big companies now trying to get on board with that, HP and IBM. Um, and what I want to talk about today is DevOps is actually more than bringing development and operations closer together. It's really about having better communication, awareness, uh, vocabulary, uh, skill sharing across all parts of the company in order to build better products. Um, it started and it focuses on development and operations, but it actually expands beyond that. And what I believe is, starting about two years ago, I started working with folks on bringing together, um, really focusing on bringing together what I think is the next most important part of uh, the company to bring into this you know, inner circle, and that's design. I think that um, in a lot of ways, design and designers are still siloed, and that is producing um, web apps that are not as enjoyable, robust, and fast as they could be. And we'll all benefit, uh, people who work at these companies and people who use these web apps, if we can get designers closer uh, into that conversation. So that's what I want to talk about today. Um, now, I don't know about you. I mentioned some of the places I've worked. Uh, a lot of places I've worked were ahead of this idea of bringing design and development closer together. Um, but a lot of places, that uh, idea of bringing design and development closer together was more like this, without the pillows. So that's the best joke of the talk. <laughs> Okay, it's going to be a really dry 40 minutes. I'm trying here. I need you to, I need you to try to. What? Early. Early, yeah. Oh my gosh, it is really early. Uh, luckily, the, the hard stuff is more towards the end, so we'll, I'll warm you up a little bit. Um, but seriously, it's kind of viewed, I don't know about you, but I've been in these meetings where it's viewed that if design gives up anything, well, it's kind of like a defeat, like a loss, like I lost something and the other side had a gain. And same thing from development. If we don't toe the line and we let design go overboard, then we've lost something in the fight. And really the way I think about it is these aren't opposing forces, they're complementary forces. That might, you know, it's like the yin and the yang, and that might sound a little fluffy, but Think about this. It, if you start asking the question and peeling away the layers, what is the ultimate goal of these developers and designers? It is to build an enjoyable web experience, something that users are just, and you've had that, haven't you? I just, I'm speaking at uh, Beyond Telerand in Berlin in two weeks. And I opened up their website on my phone. I don't know about you. Any website I open on the phone, I dread doing that. 
because it's terrible. And this website flew. I mean, it loaded. I clicked on the schedule. I clicked on the speakers. Every page was like instantaneous. It was not a native app. They did something, and I felt it. So sometimes you get that experience. It's really like an enjoyable, a visceral reaction. And that's what designers and developers are trying to do every day. They don't set out to build a slow, uh, ugly looking web experience. We have this, they have this same goal. It totally makes sense that they should work together and figure out the way that they're gonna achieve that together. So uh, as I mentioned, this is, uh, that's me on, on your left, and my partner Mark Zeman on the right. We're doing this company called Speed Curve. One of the first things I contributed to the company was I got these sweaters made that say Speed Curve on them. And uh, we're doing great stuff. I Check it out. We have free trials going and everything. Um, but the thing I, that got me really excited about it, Mark is a career designer. He taught design. He's from New Zealand. He taught design at the number one design uh, university in New Zealand. He was a creative director. He ran creative agencies. And more recently, in the last two years or so, he got into performance because he realized that for a lot of his customers, they were bringing, building these heavy sites that were not producing fantastic user experiences. And so he started getting into performance as a way to convey to them what their, how their sites were behaving. And what he found was there was not a lot of performance monitoring or metrics around the user experience. And that's what I started focusing on two years ago with folks from the Veloc designers who were at the Velocity Conference. How can we make this happen? So um, we bring this, you know, uh, long, these long careers in performance and design together. And I wanted to talk about that today, some um, techniques that we use, some processes that we use, but also specific tooling uh, that we use. Um, since Mark's not here, I'll channel uh, Jesenia Perez-Cruz, who is a very well-known designer and performance advocate uh, out of Philadelphia. And she uh, says that she used to be a reckless designer. Certainly, she has done fantastic work. It looks fantastic. But when it comes to performance, not so much. Hopefully, there's no one here that's measuring their onload time in minutes. OK, now that's, I'd say that was pretty close to the first joke, like up there. So yeah, here, thank you. I got from the second row, I got one chuckle. And OK, still someone chuckling there. Thank you, thank you. No, seriously, this was her page load time, 2 minutes, 46 seconds. Are you kidding me? Was her goal to st set out to build this heavy, slow website with six megs? No, it was just, and she'll, she confesses this. She just spoke at Velocity last week. It was a lack of awareness, just not thinking about that part of the equation, right? So, uh, and yet, we know, if you've been to any of my talks or been to Velocity, we have scores of these case studies that show that speed, performance, is correlated, highly correlated, to happy users and positive business metrics. So we know that fast is good. So we have this kind of quandary that's facing us. We know that designers and developers often work in silos. And this can produce designs that are going to be hard to implement in a performant way. And yet we know that performance, that being fast, is important to the business and to users. So how can we close this gap? How can we solve this quandary? So now I'm going to channel Mark, my partner, uh, who, from his work at these creative agencies as a creative director, develop some practices, some best practices, for bringing design and development closer together. Hopefully, you're doing some of these where you work. One is to start with small interdisciplinary teams. Don't just start with someone from design and someone from product, or someone from marketing and someone from sales. Pull someone, at least one person, from those major organizations together and actually co-locate them in the early stages of the project. Have them working together 
sharing their ideas side by side, day in and day out. Um, and at that beginning time of the product development, um, establish the guiding principles for what this team is about to build. That's going to be really important when you get further down the road and priorities and resources become very contentious, right? If you've established the guiding principles, everyone on the team knows what the priority is and the direction they should be going in. They might need to recheck every once in a while, but they know, they should know where they're headed. Um, to try to bring this home, I have this example from Mark's work. This was an actual client that he worked with in New Zealand, a news website, where their goal was to have small, uh, easily consumed news stories. Uh, mostly served over mobile for people waiting on a uh, for a bus, waiting in line for coffee. So it had to be, the content had to be structured in a way that could be consumed and browsed very quickly, but it also had to be delivered very quickly. So even at these high level guiding principles, they set a performance goal. So if you're at this talk and you work on a web app, it's probably on your shoulders to make sure to set goals like this for the group. Now, uh, if you have this group sitting together from the very beginning, they can start prototyping from the very beginning. So we move away from that uh, situation where you have isolated groups throwing their deliverables over the wall maybe closest to what I'm talking about today, that's the uh, designer's Photoshop mock-up that gets handed off to development. We don't want that. We still want designers in this small interdisciplinary group sitting in a room together, but instead of working on mock-ups, they're working on actual content, actual collateral that's gonna be given to the developer sitting next to them and integrated into the prototype immediately, right? And if you're prototyping from the beginning, you can start measuring performance from the beginning. It doesn't mean that you optimize right away, but at least you know where the pain points are. And then, as you're sitting in traffic, taking a shower, going to a conference, you're aware of those pain points in the back of your mind and you're thinking about them. And you're thinking of possible solutions, you're picking out talks to go to, that might address that area that you're going to have to solve, or the pain point might be something that you know you're going to move away from when you go to actual coding. But at least be tracking that from the beginning so you know it's not a surprise at the end where you try to speed it up in the last week before delivery. And if you have these goals, these guiding principles, and you're gathering metrics, you can do something that's become very popular called performance budgets. Uh, there's a a uh, great article from Tim Cadlick uh, that talks about performance budgets. And this is where you've decided what it is it's going to take to deliver that great, enjoyable, fast user experience. And with every build, you see how your product is performing against those goals. You can see here, this is a speed curve chart where we have a customer uh, that's not doing too well with their start render goal to try to get that content to the user as quickly as possible. Another thing you can do is to uh, really get performance in the minds of everyone in the organization is do something like, uh, this is a slide from uh, Lara Hogan's talk, she's at Etsy, where if you're on the internal IP, this additional widget gets written into the page that actually makes visible all the performance metrics that are being gathered in the browser, in the page, for this experience. And so, in, uh, these are called in-page reminders. In this case, they've set a performance budget, they call it an SLA, for back-end response time, and this page has violated that budget. And so what will happen is, and I've done this at Google, Yahoo, other companies, where you share this with everyone in the company, not just dev, and all of a sudden someone in customer support 
or HR or sales is using the product, they get this egregious violation of the performance goals and they walk over and they talk to development. And so you get everyone in the company thinking about performance. Uh, probably you're doing RUM, real user monitoring, where you have JavaScript. And if people want to come sit up front too, folks in the back, you can sit right up here. Um, where you're gathering real user metrics in the browser, and we'll talk about how to do that in a minute. Um, basically, my goal when I have built these widgets for the companies I've been at, anything that's being measured in the browser, anything that's being uh, gathered and beaconed back to our data warehouse, I make it possible to see that data in the page itself so that as people on the team are using the product, guys, you can sit up front if you want right here on the floor. Um, as people are using the product, they can see what the metrics are and maybe discover a pain point that it doesn't have focus right now. And the way I do this, I like JavaScript, so I build them as bookmarklets and make them so that they're only available to people in the company. So I've talked a bit about this uh, quandary, this gap that we have where we know that speed performance is important, um, and yet sometimes we get these designs that are going to be hard to implement in a performant way. And some practices, some processes that you can use in your company to try to mitigate that gap, right? And I've talked about setting these guiding principles, these goals, which should include performance goals, and how you can make those metrics. You can track them from the beginning, set budgets, make, everyone, make them visible to everyone in the company so there's more awareness. But I haven't actually talked about what to measure. So what should we measure when we're trying to measure performance or speed or this great user experience? So let's take a little retrospective behind um, measuring performance. I've been doing it for 13 years. So back in 2002, when I started as Chief Performance Yahoo, we had this system uh, from Keynote Systems that was reported, and I was working on My Yahoo, um, that reported the My Yahoo load time as very fast. It you know, was a few hundred, under a second. And that seemed you know, pretty good to me. But it didn't reflect my experiences. I just used My Yahoo on uh, the browser. And so I dug into what was behind this measurement. And I discovered that Keynote Systems, Gomez, a lot of these very early synthetic systems were doing just what this chart is. This is a Keynote chart from 2002. It was measuring how long it took to download the HTML document. And we all know that pages contain 50 to 100, sometimes 1,000 different resources. The average today is 100, a little over 100. None of that was being measured. No JavaScript, no CSS, none of it. It was just the HTML document. And so really, this didn't correlate at all with what the user experience was. So I set out to find a performance met metric, a way to measure performance that did have a higher correlation to what users were actually seeing in the browser. Um, so I started working in about 2003 on what uh, was the world's first RUM system. We called it Round Trip. And this is what it looked like. We would set a little timer at the top of the page, as high up in the page as possible. That was the start time. And then we would attach a handler to the onload event. And that was the end time. And we would beacon this back to our data warehouse. And we did this across all Yahoo properties for everyone in the world. And this was really cool. We were getting metrics from our real users. We didn't have to build any testing infrastructure to do that. We just had to build a data warehouse. And we didn't have to fight that battle of trying to simulate what the user environment was really like. Because guess what? We were measuring in the user environment. We were measuring real users. So these metrics reflected the real user's account, how many emails they had, how many photos they had where they were geographically located, what their connection speed was, what their hardware profile was, what browser they were using. The data was a perfect, exact reflection of the real user environment. 
And that was fantastic. We had never had that before. But there were some downsides. As you can see, we've got this start time up here. There we go. We have this start time up here, but this completely ignores how long it took to download the HTML document and stitch it together on the back end. Also, it's using the default JavaScript timer, which John Resig famously uh, wrote about, has a latency about 50 to 150 milliseconds in it. So it's not a very accurate timer. So these RUM systems started to uh, get more popular in 2008. I left Yahoo and open sourced uh, some code to do this. The best solution in the world right now is based on Yahoo's round trip code. It's called Boomerang. That came out in about 2010. So RUM really took off, but it had these downsides. So in 2010, when I was at Google, we got together with folks from Microsoft and started the W3C Web Performance Working Group. And the initial goal was to collect more accurate metrics. So we started off working on the web timing specs. There's three of them. There's nav timing. This is the metrics for the overall page, like how long it took the page to load. And you can get at it through window.performance.timing. Uh, Most famously, there's window.performance.timing.navigation start. So that solved the drawback that we had before, where we did not have an accurate start time. Navigation start is measured by all browsers except Safari as the time that the user initiates navigating to the next page that they want to go to. So it's, and it's, not, it's implemented in the browser. There's no blocking from JavaScript or anything else. So it's highly accurate. Also, there's window.performance.now, which is a high resolution timer, so there's no latency. The second spec that's part of web timing is resource timing. This is where you can get detailed information for every resource in the page, for every image, every style sheet, every script, the DNS lookup time, the TCP connect time, the content download time, uh, SSL negotiation if necessary. Um, and you can get at that through performance.get entries and a few other APIs. And then the last one is actually very generic. It's called the user timing spec. And this has uh, very abstract uh, functions, um, performance.mark and performance.measure. Oh, and by the way, all these slides are on my website right now. You can download them if you want. Let's not all do that at the same time. Um, and this will measure whatever the user wants. A mark, if you can think about the timeline of a page loading, a mark is just a time event in that timeline. A measure is the delta between any two marks. So it just gave people a very high level API. In the code I open sourced in 2008, it implemented this user timing spec and that was used as a basis for the, uh, for the spec that finally came out. Um, it's not that hard to implement as a polyfill so we can even get it on Safari, but it was nice to have it built into the browser so every website in the world doesn't have to write that code and add it to the weight of the page. So for all browsers except Safari, it's built in. So with these specs, we got around the drawbacks of RUM measuring window.unload. We had a more accurate start time. We had a more accurate timer. The problem was during the time it took between when RUM became popular and these specs came out, pages changed. And window.unload, unlike the Web 1.0 world, in the Web 2.0 world, window.onload is not highly correlated with what the user sees. So let me highlight that with two very popular examples. Anyone here use Gmail? How much do you love it when Gmail starts, right? It's kind of slow. This is what the page looks like, Gmail looks like at the onload event. There's nothing on the page. So it's not until about a second later that you actually get most of those pixels in the viewport rendered with the information, with the content that you're waiting for, right? So if the Gmail team is using window.onload as their performance metric, it completely does not reflect the user experience, right? It's way too optimistic. It's, it's painting a rosy picture. It's not as critical as it should be. Let's look at another example, Amazon. 
I don't know about you, I think Amazon pages are very heavy. But if we look at it, almost all the pixels in the viewport are rendered in two seconds. Now it's true, it takes another eight seconds for onload to fire. Look at the size, I don't know what the official term is, I call it the elevator. Look at the size of the elevator relative to the elevator shaft, right? But then look at it when it's done. That's because below the fold, all of that cross-promotion, uh, reviews, uh, all that other information, specs about the product you're looking at, all of that has loaded below the fold, but they've done that in a way that it doesn't block the content in the viewport. So this is fantastic, right? But if you were using window.onload for, oh, you can't see it, it got cut off. That's too bad. So this was about two seconds to see this and about 9.7 seconds to see this. If you were using window.onload as your performance metric, it again is not correlated at all with what the user is seeing. So we can look, so we need something different. Don't use window.onload. If you care about the user experience and my earlier point about what are designers and developers really after, creating fantastic user experience. So if you don't care about the user experience, use window.onload. But if you care about the user experience, we're gonna to have to find something different because window.onload does not necessarily reflect the user experience. Okay, so we could look at nav timing. What else could we use? We could look at nav timing. It has this thing called DOM Interactive. That sounds pretty good. In fact, Netflix just published this article a couple months ago about how they're using DOM Interactive as a better proxy for what the user experience is. And for them, I actually investigated it. It's a good choice. But you have to be careful because it's very easy to find popular websites where again, there's no correlation to the user experience. This is CNN at the time of DOM Interactive. Oh, and this tool is WebPageTest. If you've never used it, webpagetest.org. Write that down, that's the most important takeaway from the talk. My company, SpeedCurve, is based on WebPageTest. Uh, at the time of DOM Interactive, there's almost nothing on the page. So the DOM might be interactive, but it doesn't reflect delivering content to the user. And for CNET, it's even worse. There's nothing on the page at the time of DOM Interactive. So these, this metric is measuring something about the mechanics of a browser, right? Is there any blocking JavaScript or could uh, JavaScript actually alter the DOM at this point, but there's a style sheet that's blocking all rendering anyway, so DOM interact. I've never heard a user say, I'm really upset with how long it takes for DOM Interactive to fire for this page. What they care about is the content on the page. And so it doesn't matter how much JavaScript or how many HTTP requests or how much is blocking or what the DOM Interactive is. What matters is when you get the content to the user so they can use it. DOM Interactive is not doing that. Uh, there's a, the best stat you can use if you want to use a, a generic metric is speed index. So this again comes from web page test. Uh, it was created by Pat Meenan, who's the creator of Web Page Test. And it's kind of like the average time it takes for a pixel to get displayed on the page. And he has this write up that talks about the area above the graph, and it's got some um, limits in there that we're going to have to go back to high school days to remember how to process. But he describes it pretty well. But the thumbnail takeaway is it's the average pixel rendering time, and it's measured in milliseconds. So here, the average pixel gets rendered in about 1,700 milliseconds. Some less than that, faster than that, some slower than that. So we have these three standard performance metrics that people are probably using. How do they map to the user experience across some popular websites? So for Bing, we already know DOM Interactive is not going to be a good one. Uh, on load, these pages are not ready for users at the time of onload. Speed index is a little better reflection of the user content delivery, but still not great. Discus there uh, under speed index, um, really there's nothing for the user to interact with. So none of them really work. And then on CNN and MSN, onload is better. DOM Interactive we know is not going to be good. Speed index, again, is an average, so there's going to be a lot of content that comes in after speed index. Onload is good, but onload doesn't work for being in Discus and Gmail. So hopefully you know where I'm going here. There's no single performance metric 
that is going to reflect the user experience on every website, on your website, right? Anyone get the connotation of the photo, the background photo? This is first base. The runner just got there before the throw, so it's a single. Yep, that's right, third best joke of the talk. This is really, it's not going well. <laughs> so, I mean, I just went through this whole history of performance metrics and, and pointed out the flaws of all of these things that we've used, onload and DOM interactive and speed index. Is anyone surprised at this conclusion that they don't necessarily work to reflect, to measure the user experience for your website? No. And yet, everyone in the world is using these metrics. Almost everyone. Instead, we need to find performance metrics that are going to more accurately reflect the way the user interacts with your website, with your web app. And the way to do that is to really focus on the user experience. And the only metric that's going to do that is a custom metric. There is not, websites are so complex. They're uh, lazy loading content, preloading content, loading content asynchronously. They're using Ajax. Uh, they're not, you know, they're uh, a multi-page web app. So many differences, you are not going to find a standard built-in performance metric that is correct for your web app. You're going to have to build your own custom metrics. How do you do this? Okay. Hopefully, from the guiding principles, Pop a few stacks. Remember at the beginning, we talked about guiding principles. The interdisciplinary team is sitting together. They're talking about what's important for this uh, product that they're building. What is the most important element? Sure, we have cross-promotion. We have uh, uh, your, your account history. But it's the product detail photo, or whatever your app is. There are critical content on that page that the user is focusing on first. So hopefully you know what those critical design elements are. And then you can use that user timing spec that I mentioned before, mark and measure, to measure how long it takes for that content to get delivered to the user. And then the nice thing about using a spec is all of these service providers, like Speed Curve, like Web Page Test, like Google Analytics, can build their services on that spec. And so there are a ton of ROM and synthetic performance metric services out there that if you use the user timing spec, it will harvest all of the marks and measures in your page and report them back into their data warehouse so you can see them without having to build any custom data gathering infrastructure. OK, so I really like details. Uh, Let's talk about how to actually build a custom metric. Perhaps the most famous custom metric was written uh, about uh, from Twitter. It's the time to first tweet. They talked about how they disregard all other performance metrics. What they care about is how long it takes that first tweet in your timeline to get displayed. OK, so imagine we want to build a custom metric to do this. How would you do it? Seems simple. It's actually really hard. It took me a couple months to figure out. So the markup for this tweet is going to get delivered in the HTML document. There's markup for the text if you're going to mangle your JPEG. There's also market markup for the IMG tag, for the image. Now, that image, the, the text of the tweet is already there in the HTML document. That image is going to take another extra step. You're either going to, the browser is either going to have to read it from cache or download it. So if we want to get the time it takes for this tweet to get displayed to the user, we need the upper bound, which is going to be the time for the image to get displayed. So let's focus on that. How do we do that? So we need to come up with a custom metric, not for the image load time. We want the image display time. And this is what took months to figure out. So here's the markup for the tweet. Uh, we see this image that's in there. What's one of the first things you would probably do? The first thing I thought of, add an onload. Now you can see here I'm using the user timing spec. I'm calling performance.measure. And I'm going to call this measurement image displayed, right? 
Now you'll notice, I didn't call mark, I just called measure. Instead of giving two uh, markers in the page that take a delta of, I only gave the name of this new one, the name. So the uh, start time metric by default is navigation start. And the end time metric is now. So I can just use those default values because that's exactly what I want. I want to know how long it took from the time the user started the navigation to this code being executed when the image is downloaded. And so all I have to do is provide the name and the delta now minus navigation start is going to give me the delta that I care about, the time measurement. So this is great, but we're not done. Because what happens if you have blocking resources, like a style sheet? A style sheet, it used to be in the old days, style sheets and scripts blocked images from loading. That ended in 2008. Uh, now, style sheets don't block the image from downloading. It only blocks rendering. A style sheet blocks the entire page from rendering. So suppose you have a style sheet that's huge and really slow. It's going to start downloading. Until it's done, the entire page will not render. But it will still get parsed. And this image will get downloaded very quickly. The onload will fire. And we'll get this very optimistic image display time. Because the onload fired, but the image isn't rendered until the huge, slow CSS gets downloaded. So we can't rely on the image onload. So we'll add another timer. We'll just put a script at the bottom of the page. And we'll say uh, performance.measure image displayed. Because it turns out that style sheets do block inline scripts from executing. So this script will not execute until the style sheet is done, downloaded, right? And getting parsed and, and uh, applied. So, now we have two metrics that are measuring the same thing. We only want one. What we really want is the higher of the two, the maximum value of the two. And the way we can ensure that happens is, and now the code is off the bottom of the page, uh, but it's the same code in both places. We're first going to clear any measures called image displayed, and then we'll take one. So suppose there is a blocking script. This image downloads very quickly. It will clear the measures. It will create a new measure called image displayed. But then finally, the style sheet is done. And that old measurement will get cleared, and a new one gets created. So we get the maximum of the two values. Consider the other scenario, where the image is really slow, but the style sheet isn't. The style sheet finishes very quickly. This will execute, but we're still waiting for the slow image. Um, so we'll create an image displayed measurement. But then finally, the image will finish downloading. And so we'll clear that first one, and we'll set the second measurement. And that's what we want, the maximum of those two values. And those are the only two scenarios. Either the download is the blocking down, the image is the blocking download. It's taking a really long time. We cover that. Or there's some other blocking resource, a script, a style sheet that's blocking the image. And we've covered that. So this is what took uh, a fair amount of time to research, um, but it's a great way. And it turns out that for measuring most critical design elements, an image is involved. So this will work for most of the critical design elements that you have to deal with. So now, if you're Twitter or if you're your website, you can create a custom metric for those critical design elements. And you can track those. So this is, again, a real customer from Speed Curve. Uh, and they've actually implemented custom metrics. They don't have to do any special programming in Speed Curve language. They're just using the spec. Speed Curve is built on web page test. Web page test takes all of the custom metrics, all of the user timing marks and measures, and makes them visible. We store that data, and we can show it to you and give you timelines. So they've actually, this customer has created a custom metric called all ads rendered, and another one called image displayed. I'm guessing they have a hero image in the, play, in the page. So let me wrap up. What are the takeaways from today? And it was a long, you know, I left the detailed part there at the end. But we started off talking about how we, 
the world of performance metrics really wasn't correlated to user experience. But today, especially with the complexity of techniques that we employ for building web pages, we have to really focus on the user experience. Because there can be a lot of things, fonts, style sheets, scripts, that block the user experience. So we need to focus on user experience metrics. The performance metrics that are built into browsers and most services don't reflect that. And they, there's no way that they can, given the large number of websites out there and the different techniques for building them. So the only solution for getting metrics that really capture how quickly you're delivering that user experience is building custom metrics. And if you do that, we'll all have these great, enjoyable, fast user experiences. Thank you. So I have time for a few questions if anyone has a question. Right here. Yeah, you. I'll just shout it out. Do you try to account for, let's say, if my site is uh, ads driven or have a lot of like ads within the within the site? How do you account for uh, like third party applications? So the question was, how do you account for third party content in the page like ads? And when you mean, um, do you mean how do you measure that with custom metrics? Yeah. So should you even include that in your metrics? I think you should um, because you hopefully have some kind of SLA with your third parties, uh, analytics, ads, um, you know, widgets, and you want to measure how long they're taking. Um, but really, again, users don't say, oh, I'm really bummed that this Twitter widget or this uh, uh, Google Analytics or this ad block the content I cared about. They just care about that content that they're looking for, like the product image. And so if you put that custom metric on the product image, you'll be measuring the user experience. Measuring that third party content is actually a secondary metric for helping you debug what's going on in your page, what's causing it to be so slow. Because it might be that you have a widget or ads that are blocking that product image. So to solve the product image problem, you might need to solve this third party problem. Hey, I'm going to wrap up. People are already walking out. But just come up and ask questions. I'll be here for 20, 30 minutes. Thank you.